welcome to The Appointment. I'm Shireen Bhan and we're in conversation with the Global Chairman of KPMG, John Vermeer. Mr. Vermeer, I appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. So you've decided to bring the Global Board of KPMG and your Global Council down to India. Is the India story as exciting as it's made out to be? Listen, India is a really important market for us and uh, I really appreciate your taking the time to have me on today. I appreciate it. Uh, it's a uh, very fast-growing region of our KPMG world. In fact, uh, last year, India was our fastest growing member firm, and uh, we certainly expect that to continue in the future. But it's not just, I think, how fast India is growing. I think part of the story for us at KPMG is what our firm in India is contributing to the next, rest of the network in terms of resources, in terms of thought leadership, and a number of things that uh, I think are helping it really be a major source of innovation and accelerating growth mm -hmm. across the entire KPMG world. I'll talk to you about KPMG's plan for India in just a bit, but let me ask you about what this government is doing in terms of the reform initiatives. We've just had the union budget being presented. Uh, you know, the, the slogan is make in India, invest in India. In your conversations with global business leaders at this point in time, how strong is the commitment to India? There's been a lot of talk about foreign direct investment. The government has liberalized sectors like defense further for, for FDI. Do you believe that we are likely to see big ticket FDI coming? into sectors like defense? You know, I think it's, uh, I think the optimism about India is growing outside of India. I was with, uh, I was in Washington when Mr. Modi came for his official visit uh, just before the end of the mm -hmm. year. <clears throat> there was a fairly broad cross-section of business leaders there at that meeting. And uh, since that time, I've had a number of conversations with a number of the CEOs of leading multinationals all over the world. And uh, I think uh, the new leadership, a new government in India has created a tremendous amount of optimism about whether or not the really difficult issues and the reforms that need to be undertaken in India are going to be uh, approached in a very systematic way. And so I think we're at a point now where uh, there's a lot that remains to be done and therefore it remains to be seen whether or not these, uh, all these reforms come to fruition. But I sense in my conversations with other executives that uh, there is a very changed mood about India, outside of India, and uh, a growing sense of confidence about whether it's the ease of doing business mm -hmm. and some of those other reforms that you referred to in specific industries uh, uh, are absolutely going to take hold. And uh, I think companies all over the world are looking at India as an absolute uh, positive source of investment. Is that the reason why you decided to bring the KPMG Global Board as well as your Global Executive Council to India? It's very important. You know, our council is made up of the senior partners of our member firms across almost all of our member firms, 140 member firms around the world. And <clears throat> it's very important that our leadership in countries all over the world understand the India story. And there's no better way to convey that mm. than to get them all here here firsthand, we're going to hear from a number of government officials, we're going to meet with clients, uh, <clears throat> and hear from our leadership here in our local practice about what those opportunities for investment are. So what we will end up with uh, at the end of this week is <clears throat> close to 100 ambassadors within KPMG going back all over the world, and when they meet with clients in their home country, talking to them about the opportunity that India uh, presents for the entire world. So I think it's a great opportunity for uh, the companies that we work with all over the world to be better informed about the opportunity mm -hmm. here. And uh, it's also a great opportunity for our people to see firsthand what is happening. So what worries you about global growth at this point in time? What would be the big downside risks that you're focused on? You know, I think uh, I was, it's interesting. I was in a meeting with a relatively small group of CEOs uh, from all over the world uh, not that long ago. And when we opened the meeting by saying, what's your number one concern? There was a very unanimous uh, answer to that. And it focused on geopolitical risks around the world sure. at the moment. And while that may seem self-obvious at, at this point, uh, they went back and looked at the answer to that question the previous three years that this meeting was held, mm. and geopolitical risk wasn't in the top ten risks identified in those previous three years. So you can see, I think, how that's shifted and how that's changed mm. here recently. 
Uh, and some of the things you alluded to, whether it's the situation in the Ukraine, whether it's the uh, um, radical threat that we're seeing expand in a number of places throughout Europe, uh, a, a number of places that I think are causing not just political concern or political risk, but clearly spilling over into having an impact on the economy and the recovery as well. So mm -hmm. I think geopolitical risk is certainly number one on that, um, that list of concerns. I think second, when I talk to CEOs, is concern about the regulatory environment. Mm -hmm. And I think executives understand the need for robust and what we would characterize as smart regulation. Sure. I think there are more and more examples around the world where it doesn't quite feel like smart regulation and it feels like a regulatory environment that is um, making it very challenging for companies to grow and expand in a way that I think would have a really positive impact on these societies and these economies in, in total. So those are probably the two first answers I would, I would give you. Okay. Speaking of the regulatory environment, and we've just had this government say that they are going to defer the GAR rules for at least another two mm -hmm. years, and they would now like to coincide the introduction of GAR or the rollout of GAR with what the OECD decides to do as far as the best rules are concerned. Uh, in your experience and in the conversations that you're having with global leaders at this point in time, how much of an issue is this? And the transition to a GAR world in that sense, or a BIPs world in that sense, what is that going to mean? Well, it's a very significant issue. I think it's very much on the minds of companies all over the world. Uh, <clears throat> we're in this very unique, I think, moment in time where companies are very much trying to globalize in an environment where regulation is very much country-based. Sure. And that creates a dichotomy which creates significant uncertainties as companies are trying to expand globally. And part of what KPMG really brings to, I think, the companies that we work with is trying to bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. How do you take companies who are very globally minded, trying to operate and expand globally, and help them succeed in a world where regulation is very much country-based? I think the, the positive dynamic around some of the BEPS um, evolutions and, and the conversations taking place right now is to try and create a more level playing field mm. and more consistency across countries in some of these areas that have a very significant impact on your ability to um, trade globally, transfer pricing issues from yeah. a tax standpoint, all of those things that create significant uncertainties for company try, companies trying to take advantage sure. of growth markets all over the world in a very uncertain regulatory environment. So I'm very much, I think, supportive of any effort to get as much consistency as we can by getting governments working together to try and develop a common platform and a level playing ground, if you will, for companies trying to do business cross-border. You know, speaking of regulatory risk or tax-related risk, and that was the number one concern in India over the last, say, 24 months or so, uh, or perhaps even a little longer. Uh, since this government has come into office, they have said that while they haven't changed the retrospective law, they have said that they will not move towards an era of retrospective taxation. Does that give investors and clients a sense of comfort? That or is, is that not good enough? No, that's a very important issue, I think, for companies thinking about investing in India and, frankly, for companies located in India in terms of expanding investment. Uh, there is nothing that hurts economic expansion more than uncertainty. And <clears throat> one of the most significant uncertainties that you can create is an environment where companies uh, don't have the confidence mm. that the regulations they operated in and the tax costs they thought they were going to incur uh, could potentially be changed retroactively. So I think uh, Mr. Modi and his, his leadership team here understands that fact. They recognize that that kind of uncertainty is a significant inhibitor to companies expanding and locating and operating in India. And uh, it's an uncertainty that it seems to me is very easy to uh, control and eliminate. And I, I think there is uh, great optimism and confidence for companies looking into India at this mm -hmm. point with the signals that Mr. Modi has sent that uh, he understands that and he's not interested in creating further expansion of a retrospective sure. uh, regime around tax policy.